Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us and the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things upon the earth. In him also we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. In John 17, 3, Jesus states, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And Christ makes the claim that the Father is the only true God. How does a Christian reconcile Christ's claim that the Father is the only true God? Clarification. If the Father is the only true God, then to my understanding, that would negate the concept of the Trinity, because if the Father is indeed the only true God, then... No one else can be, including the Son and the Holy Spirit. I would say that it's not correct to think that if the Father is the only true God, that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are not also the only true God. I have developed a model of the Trinity whereby God is a single spiritual substance or soul which is endowed with three sets of rational faculties such that each one is sufficient for personhood. Sunday morning at St. Andrews, we sang one of my favorite hymns, And Can It Be, and by Charles Wesley. I love the hymn, except I have to edit it. I t try to tell my congregation when we get to the refrain, that thou, my God, shouldst die for me, Charles Wesley, shame on you. God died? On the cross? Are you crazy? <laughs> Charles Wesley, shame on you! Are you crazy? The hill outside of Jerusalem would have been vaporized. Jerusalem would have vanished along with the whole rest of creation. Because apart from the being of God, nothing can exist for a split second. God didn't die. The God-man died. The God who took upon himself a human nature died touching his humanity. But the deity didn't perish. 
on the cross. It may sound great in our hymns, but it's a ghastly thought. Good evening from Atlanta, Georgia. Good morning, anywhere else in the world or good afternoon. So this is day two, the last se session of the Theological Conference for May 6, 2023, the year of our Lord. And as you can see there, we have Sir Anthony Buzzard coming up for this last session. And tomorrow we start at 10 a.m. These are Eastern Standard Times or New York Time. If you are uh, in, uh, be it Korea or viewers in Vietnam, Australia, New Zealand, please keep the times in mind. And you can just Google easily and find out the time at your, at your place of residence. Okay, before then, though, we had a draw. So I've been announcing a free draw for an item from the Kingdom of God Ministry and Missions store. As you can see, they have many things there that you can win tonight. So <clears throat> I'll do the draw. We'll do the old Wheel of Fortune type of type of draw so i have i think around 15 names so there's the wheel and we have the initials there for anonymity sake of course whoever wins please email me carlos at the human jesus.org and uh, oh actually sorry i should say i'll i will email the winner and then uh we'll go from there regarding the item you would like from that store and if it's a clothing uh, i'll ask for obviously size and color and all that stuff so good luck we'll do the draw now or godspeed if you prefer so we have 15 names i think there Maybe more actually. One, two, three, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. Actually, sixteen. So we'll do three spins of the wheel. So we'll give you more chances to win. We'll do three. So three lucky winners tonight. So here we go with the first. Sorry, let's try that again. Oops, not sure if that worked. I think that worked. Anyway, let me know if that worked. I think it caught out on my end here. So, all right, the first winner is SJ. So congrats there to SJ. Let me just mark it down. We have two more tries here for anyone else on this wheel. So let me reset it and we'll do it again. Okay, that was a close one there. SW. Next winner, let me mark that down. All right, so the last spin of the wheel here. <clears throat> NL, so congrats to the winners. 
and thanks to everyone who participated. So again, the initials that one and L, SW and SJ. So I'll contact you for uh, the, um, <clears throat> so you can pick uh, from that store. Again, it's the KOG Mission Store. I'll send the link obviously to the store if you don't have it. But you can find it on kogmissions.com, Kingdom of God Ministry and Missions. And these designs are mostly done, I believe, by Tracy, our co-ministry partner. So very talented in that field. So congrats. All right. Now, without further ado, as they say, I think that's how you pronounce it. Okay, so this man obviously needs uh, no introduction by, but for the benefit of those few who have not heard of Anthony Buzzard. He was born in Surrey, England, educated at Oxford University and Bethany Theological Seminary. He served as co-editor of a journal from the Radical Reformation, is the current editor-in-chief of Focus on the Kingdom, which is a free monthly magazine you can access through our website, focusonthekingdom.org. He's married to Barbara and lives in Fayetteville. And tonight he will present on this issue of amillennialism. And actually I'll ask Anthony to tell us what that means first in his own words, a dangerous symptom of losing the saving gospel about the kingdom of God. And there you have the synopsis. So what I will do now is share the screen here. Anthony will read from his paper, and this will be available uh, soon, I hope. And um, good evening, Anthony. It's all yours. All right, Carlos, thank you very much. <clears throat> and for all your good work today, the skill with which you manage this uh, computer business is amazing. So our millennialism, a millennialism probably in England, our millennialism simply means no millennium. And believe me, when I give these talks, I have people in mind, I won't name them, but my ear is attuned to what goes on in the Unitarian movement. I'm quite conscious of what I hear. And so I'm deliberately trying to correct mistakes that I think are serious. You mustn't assume that because you're a Unitarian, there's nothing to worry about. You couldn't make any mistakes. Oh, yes, you could. You could have people teaching falsities even among Unitarians. So keep that in mind. And uh, our millennialism, the title is a dangerous, I call it dangerous, because all falsity, all falsehood is dangerous. A dangerous symptom of losing the saving gospel about the kingdom of God. This is the 32nd annual conference. I've been at all of them. And the danger then, and I mean danger, these are not academic things to be argued about in an academic manner. These are practical issues for you individually. The danger of getting rid of the future by moving it into the present. If you don't like the future, you say, well, it's, it's present or it's all past. That is wrong. So 10 reasons why the millennium, that's the thousand year reign mentioned specifically only in Revelation 20, 10 reasons why the millennium, that future reign of a thousand years in Revelation 20, is not now. And if you think otherwise, I would invite you to, to reconsider. So our millennialism, meaning literally no millennium, no thousand year period in the future, it teaches that we are currently reigning with Christ, quote, spiritually having had our personal figurative resurrection at our conversion, at baptism. So the idea is that when you were converted and baptized, then you began to reign with Christ. I'm against that, and I'm going to try to prove that that is false. There are these 10 major reasons why the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ and his saints in Revelation 20, must lie in the future. 
To teach otherwise is to undermine Christian hope and should be strenuously avoided. To imagine that you and I are now reigning as kings, and I'm speaking to you on the day in which Charles III was crowned, as you know, as king, to imagine that you today are now reigning as kings is a dramatic contradiction of the Bible. Don't want to go there. Paul warned against such a very false idea in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 8. Paul said sarcastically, he said to the Corinthians, you are already filled. You've already become kings without us. You must be joking, so to speak. And indeed, Paul then said, look at this, I wish that you had become kings so that we also might be reigning as kings with you. Isn't that powerful? Even more directly, he called out by name a couple of guys, Philetus and Hymenaeus, who very falsely taught that the future resurrection had already occurred. That's awfully bad. And they were thus overthrowing the faith of some, 2 Timothy 2.17. Note too, that the prospect of our future reigning as kings with Jesus is the equivalent in the Bible of obtaining salvation in Messiah Jesus with its glory of the age to come. 2 Timothy 2.10. So this is our goal. And you don't want to be confused about the goal. Our millennialism rejects and predates the reality of the future kingdom and our part in it. Our millennialism, denying Revelation 20, is a threat to the saving gospel about the kingdom of God. Okay, 10 reasons. <laughs> the reign of Christ and the saints in Revelation 20 follows the events of the return of Christ given in chapter 19. It follows. Revelation 19, 11, we read this, I saw, and I saw, rather, it introduces a sequence of events. Linked at verse 17, and I saw, verse 19, and I saw, with the complete overthrow of the future beast, that's the Antichrist and the false prophet, his sidekick, future beast and the false prophet, in verse 20. And it shows you the destruction of the remainder of those who oppose Jesus. Verse 21. Then in Revelation 20, verse 1, and I saw, continues the sequence and deals with the complete removal from the world scene of the ultimate enemy, who is Satan, that's the external devil, the Satan himself. Following that event comes the next stage of the drama. And I saw thrones and people sitting on them who had been given authority to rule, Revelation 20 to 4, 20 verse 4. This is a huge subject. Do you realize that your destiny as successful Christians is to rule with Christ in a renewed earth coming? Okay, point two. The reign or the rule of the saints with Christ depends on a literal resurrection. 20 verse 5 of Revelation, the noun Resurrection in Greek, anastasis, occurs about 40 times in the New Testament. In every case, apart from very special use in Luke 2.34, anastasis, resurrection, refers to a real resurrection of dead people to life. Positively not a resurrection in quotes. Not a so-called figurative resurrection from the life of sin to life as a Christian, as our millennialism has to argue. It would be both unnatural and inconsistent to think of anything but the real resurrection of dead people in Revelation 20, verse 4 to 5. Point three, John in Revelation 20 described a real resurrection, not a figurative one, by saying that the occupants of the throne came to life after being beheaded. The core of the millennial passage reads like this. I saw those persons who had been beheaded and they came to life. This is the first resurrection. People, of course, you obviously understand, are not beheaded when they're converted, but they may die a literal death as a martyr. The coming to life in this passage is of those who had been beheaded, cannot by any possible stretch 
of the imagination describe conversion. Yet our millennialism has to deal with these words in this extraordinary and dismissive way in order to avoid a literal resurrection. Point four, in Revelation 20 verse three, Satan, that's the external devil, the Satan, is bound, and I read, so that he, the Satan, can no longer deceive the nations. Earlier in the same book, John describes the Satan as one who is now currently deceiving the whole world, Revelation 12 verse 9 and 1 John 5 9 also. But here in Revelation 20 verse 3, Satan is bound and prevented from deceiving the nations any longer. I hope you're sighing a sigh of relief when you read that. Right now, the whole world lies in the power of the deception of the devil. Absolutely, the kingdom of God is not reigning across the world. The devil is. It's beyond question that Satan cannot, at the same time, be deceiving the whole world and not deceiving the nations any longer at the same time. That would be impossible. Yet the whole our millennial school is committed to that contradiction. Our millennialism teaches that the period of time in which the Satan no longer deceives the nations, note the nations, not the church, talking about the worldwide system. Our millennialism teaches that that is the same as the period in which he is now deceiving the whole world. That's a complete self-contradiction obviously false. It would be hard to think of a more unsatisfactory method of reading the Bible. Our millennialists, we fear, are driven to these extremes by their dislike of the idea of a messianic kingdom of God to be ruled by the Messiah and his saints. And you, as a Christian, should love that idea. You should love the hope of the messianic kingdom. Point five, in Revelation 12, Verses 12 to 13, the devil is thrown down from the earth, sorry, from the heaven to the earth. That happened in Revelation 12. This, as all agree, is a time prior to the second coming. He's thrown down from heaven to the earth before the end. However, in Revelation 20, verses 1 to 2, Satan is banished entirely from the earth and sent into the abyss. Hallelujah! This is the most exciting idea in the Bible when the devil is finally banished so he can deceive the people no longer. This banishment into the abyss, which coincides with the beginning of the millennial reign, must therefore lie in the future. Satan cannot be both confined to the earth and banished from the earth into the abyss at the same time. That's the logic of what I'm getting over to you this evening. Point six, Satan is represented as extremely active and powerful in the present evil age, Galatians 1.4. John describes Satan as now currently exercising power over the whole world. The whole world, John wrote, lies in the power of the evil one. Do you, you take that in? That's the world you're living in. The whole of the world is deceived by the devil right now, barring a few enlightened people the true Christians. Second Corinthians 4.4 4, sees Satan as the god of this present age. He's the god of this present age. That's a lot of power. To grasp the New Testament view of the present activity of Satan, the following passages should be examined. You can look them up later. I do recommend that you try to read these papers slowly later on to get the most out of them. There are the verses which tell you that the devil is currently ruling. Your enemy in 1 Peter 5.8 your enemy, the devil, is now, Peter said, prowling around like a roaring lion searching for someone to devour and to deceive. And let me warn you, my good friends, brothers and sisters out there, just because you are a Unitarian does not exempt you from deception. Yet in our millennial passage in Revelation 20, we have a description of the total cessation of the influence of Satan over the nations. Satan is going to be removed from the scene, banished and sealed in the abyss. So we urge our readers and listeners to abandon this our millennial view, which makes Satan's present deceptive activity over the whole world in Revelation 12, 9, makes it compatible with the time when he's going to be bound and unable any longer 
to deceive the nations. Revelation 20, verse 3. As Dr. Nemesh this morning was working with logical propositions and contradictory propositions, I'm making that point to you today. You cannot possibly read the millennium as current because the devil is currently deceiving the whole world in that future millennium. He can't do it any longer. As easy as that. Point eight. Our millennialists sometimes argue that the present freedom of Satan, assuming the premillennial scheme, that he has not yet been bound. This contradicts the effects of the crucifixion, they say. They admit, however, that Satan must be let free for a brief period of time in Revelation 20, verse 3. This period of freedom would equally contradict the effects of the cross. So that's not an argument at all. The fact that Satan is going to be freed in the future for a short time and will yet deceive a few people is not relevant to our question about the pre-mill, R-mill argument. The biblical facts are that Satan has already been defeated, but his sentence is put into effect when his authority as God of this age is finally removed by banishment. First, Satan will go into the abyss and subsequently by being cast into the lake of fire, which is a two-stage punishment. Okay, can you move that up just a little bit, Carlos, so I can read where we got to there? Up a little bit. Did you uh yeah? Did you skip number seven? Maybe I did. It is evident yes. from Revelation. Maybe I did. Let me go back and do seven. Thank you very yeah, much. Thanks. Let me go back to seven. It's evident from Revelation 20, verse 10, that Satan is finally thrown into the lake of fire after the thousand years, the millennium, plus a short time in verse three. Thus, a thousand years separates his binding from his final removal, from his final casting into the lake of fire, verse 10. It's equally clear that the beast, the Antichrist, Daniel 7 and 8, and the false prophet are already in the lake of fire when Satan joins them a thousand years later. In John's vision, a thousand years separates the future throwing of the Antichrist into the lake of fire and Satan's arrival there. If, as the our millennial school holds wrongly, the thousand years began at the crucifixion or the conversion of the individual believer, opinions vary, what is the meaning of the throwing of the beast and false prophet into the lake of fire a thousand years later, a thousand years earlier than that time? It makes no sense at all. Premillennialism has been the view of the Abrahamic people since their inception. And I'm at pains to see that you don't lose track of that enormous truth. What John obviously describes is the ruin of the beast and false prophet at the second coming, Satan's banishment to the abyss at that same time, and his being thrown into the lake of fire to join the beast and false prophet a thousand years later. The thousand year reign, the millennium, thus follows the second coming, which is classical premillennialism. As to say, a recognition of the future messianic kingdom. Don't forget that the gospel is about the kingdom. We're not talking small stuff here. We're talking about the nature of the gospel. And I don't want you to be in any way in a muddle over that. Okay, number nine now, because I did eight already. Number nine, Satan cannot possibly already be deceiving the nations no longer, as our millennialism has to say. In Revelation 19.15, Christ at his coming strikes the nations precisely because they have been so disastrously deceived by Satan into opposing the Messiah at his future arrival. Tracy was very good and very strong and all of that, pointing out that getting things wrong is dangerous. The doctrine that it doesn't matter what you believe is very false. That's the basis of my idea. Behind this paper. Number 10, nearly all agree that the rest of the dead, as to say those not included in the first resurrection, come to life, literally, that is, at the close of the thousand years. The rest of the dead, those not in the first resurrection, come alive in resurrection at the end of the thousand years. Yet our millennialists deny that the coming to life of those in the first resurrection is a literal resurrection. The same Greek word exactly describes the resurrection of both groups. And the same words came to life occur in two consecutive sentences. And I'm going to quote 
a very famous evangelical uh, scholar, exegete Henry Alford, and he gets quoted a lot in favor of the arguments that I'm putting forward, celebrated very appropriate protests. This man was stirred to the core by the amillennial idea and came to try to oppose it. It's known as Alford's Law, Henry Alford, and it deserves to be heard again. He said, I cannot consent to distort the words of Revelation 20 from their plain sense and the chronolo chronological place in the prophecy. Those who lived next to the apostles and the whole church for 300 years understood them in the plain, literal sense. As regards the text itself, no legitimate treatment of it can extort what is known as the spiritual or amillennial interpretation, so-called, now in fashion. And then he, he makes his point again. If in a passage where two resurrections are mentioned, where certain souls come to life at the first and the rest of the dead come to life only at the end of a specified period after the first, if in such a passage, as we have in Revelation 20, if in such a passage the first resurrection may be understood to mean spiritual, allegorical, non-literal rising, while the second means literal rising, and this is where Henry Alford is so good, then there's an end of all significance in language, and scripture is wiped out as a definite testimony to anything. So I appeal to any of you who might have been lured into the amillennial view, you're doing away with the plain meaning of words. If the first resurrection, said Henry Alford, is spiritual, non-literal, and so is the second, which I suppose no one will be hard enough to maintain. But if the second is literal, that's when the rest of the dead come to life, literally, then, of course, so is the first, which in common with the primitive church and many of the best modern expositors, I do maintain, as I, Anthony, also do, I do maintain and I receive as an article of faith and hope. So, this is me now. The failure to see in Revelation 20, one to six, a future reign of the Messiah with his saints involves an extraordinary feat by which the plain meaning of words and context are thrown aside in order to sustain a theory which did not appear in the church until 300 years after the apostles. As K.L. Schmidt observed, I'm quoting a backup for me here, the man who refuses to find clear teaching by the future millennium in Revelation 20 approaches the text with preconceived ideas and gains from it neither the exact sense nor the value. And George Ladd, that Joe Martin mentioned this morning, points to a whole tradition of anti-Messianic reading, that's to say wrong reading, of the Bible. When he writes this, George Ladd said, the first anti or amill people, the anti-millenarians, they disparage the natural interpretation of Revelation 20, not for good biblical reasons, because they thought the book did not teach a millennium, get this, but because they did not like millennial doctrine. I suggest that you learn to love the idea of the millennium, and then you will be thinking as Jesus thinks and thought. I that they thus did not like the gospel of the kingdom. This is more than just an argument about prophecy. This is about the nature of the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, now I'm going to turn to a broader part of my topic. Let me now, if I may, broaden my subject to the wider issue of the saving gospel of the kingdom of God, the Christian gospel. Protestants do not seem to know that they've inherited a gospel from their Protestant heritage. The question is, does this Protestant gospel, I might refer without any uh, malice to Billy Graham and his descendants, Franklin Graham, I don't mean anything bad about them, except that we do have a duty to correct their obvious mistakes. The question is, does this Protestant gospel do justice to the Bibles and particularly Jesus' definition of, the, definition of the gospel? Let me add this sentence. The devil really only has one trick. The devil only has one trick. That's to separate Jesus from his teachings. You can go on saying, won't you receive Jesus? Hope you love Jesus and so on. Unless you define the teachings of Jesus, you're not making any intelligible sense. Jesus was the initial preacher of the saving gospel. Now I'm going to quote then from Hebrews 2 verse 3, which is 
I hope you're able to take notes on some of these verses, at least look them up later, where in Hebrews 2 verse 3, listen to this one. How then can we escape, and you and I will not escape, if we take no notice of an offer of salvation so important, she's quoting the Bible here, that God announced it when? First, through the Lord himself. Jesus, let me tell this audience clearly, did not just come to die, to die and to rise. That is false. Jesus first taught, and you're supposed to believe his teachings. Those who heard him, this is the Hebrews writer I'm quoting here, confirmed that gospel to us, quoting Hebrews 2, 3. See also Matthew 4, 17 and 23, and above all, Luke 4, verse 43. That verse, I'm sure, I, I'm hopeful, if you're doing any work with other people, you'll know. Luke 4, 43 says, I came, Jesus said this, I came to die for the sins of the world. No, that's very important, but comes later. Beginning, Luke 4, 43, I came to preach the gospel about the kingdom. That's the way, that's the reason why God commissioned me. I hope that verse is a refrigerator verse for you, Luke 4, verse 43. You use it all the time in the work you do of evangelism and trying to win others to the truth. And 1 Timothy 6, 3, 2 John 7, 9 are severe warnings. Watch out. Any departure from the words of Jesus is a grave and dangerous mistake. Tracy was talking about that earlier today. Many will say in that day, look, Lord, what we did for you. Get out of here. I never knew you. In that very context, Jesus says, beware of fake false teaching. Be careful. Jesus' own definition of the gospel is therefore the foundation of biblical faith. That needs to be underlined several times. Okay, Luther and Calvin. Now I'm going to show you how Luther and Calvin excluded Jesus' gospel. It's reasonable to ask why the kingdom of God features so little in modern evangelism. The answer is to be found in a long-standing de-emphasis on the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Why do you think we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Three almost repeated versions of the teaching of Jesus because they knew these Bible writers that that's where people are going to fall apart and they have. So Calvin and Luther got these things wrong. An unconscious offense at the messianic Jewish Jesus, they don't like that Jew Jesus who preached the kingdom, caused these two Protestant leaders to express a curious preference, watch this now, for the gospel of John. Oh, they love the Gospel of John because you can twist it and manipulate it more easily than you can Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So Calvin and Luther would prefer to have the Gospel of John as more important than the other three Gospels. Luther said this, writing the preface to his translation of the New Testament in 1522, he said this. Luther said this now. How wrong is this? Listen, John's Gospel is the only Gospel which is delicately sensitive to what is the essence of the gospel and is to be widely preferred to the other three and placed on a higher degree. Who said, I ask, how dare Luther say that John is preferable to Matthew, Mark, and Luke? That's just false. Now, G.F. Moore, good commentator, wrote, and our comments are in square brackets, quote, Luther created by a dogmatic criterion a canon of the gospel, his own idea of what the gospel is, within the canon of the books of the Bible. In other words, he chose some books and ignored others. You, my good friends out there, cannot afford to do that. Luther was using a selective and misleading procedure. Luther wrote, Luther, Martin Luther, those apostles who treat oftenest and highest of how faith alone justifies are the best evangelists. Therefore, he said, St. Paul's epistles are more a gospel than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That is utterly false, I want to tell you. Who said that Paul's epistles are more a gospel than Matthew, Mark, and Luke? The Bible ne never said that. For these, that's to say Matthew, Mark, and Luke, do not set down, said Luther, much more than the works and miracles of Christ. This is quite false. In brackets, my comment here, this is quite false. 
And Luther went on to say, the grace which we receive through Christ, no one so boldly extols as St. Paul. Watch out. Who said? You must be kidding. I say to Luther here, St. Paul did not invent the gospel. Jesus originated the gospel and Paul, of course, followed Jesus. In comparison with the gospel of John, the epistles of Paul and 1 Peter, which says Luther, are the kernel and narrow, uh, marrow of all books. Compared with them, he had a particularly harsh view of the epistle of James, because James talks about how you're justified not by faith alone, but by some works. Oh, Luther didn't like that one. And that then caused Luther to write this. He said, James is a mere letter of straw. That's the half-brother of Jesus. Oh, that's a useless letter because it doesn't agree with Luther. And he dared to say, there's nothing evangelical about the epistle of James. What? The public is so, unfortunately, unaware of the crime scene that is theology. So Moore then makes a very good comment on all that. He says it's clear that the infallibility of Scripture, which you and I believe in, has here, in fact, if not in admission, followed the infallibility of popes and councils. For well, the Scripture itself has to submit to be judged by the ultimate criterion of its accordance with Luke, with Luther. So Luther has become the new pope in the system. Don't you believe it? Find out what your pastor is preaching about the gospel. Luther, in other words, replaced one Roman Catholic dogmatic system with another, forcing the scripture to submit to Luther's own process of selection. Okay. Luther was followed then by Calvin in this wrong opinion. Calvin even ventured to suggest a different order. He wanted Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John not to be in that order. He wanted, guess what, John to come first. I want to tell you that theology is a crime scene and Unitarians don't always escape that crime scene and there's more Berean exercise to be done. The doctrine, Calvin said, which points out to us the power and benefit of the coming Christ is far more clearly exhibited by John than the other three gospels. What? That's a very false mis, uh, mis, uh, effort at trying to explain things. Very wrong. The three former, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, said Calvin, exhibit Christ's body. But John exhibits his soul. His soul. On this account, I'm accustomed, Calvin said, to say that this gospel, John, is the key to open the door for understanding the rest. Listen to that. Your friends are Calvinists. Your pastor might have had a Calvinist training. Watch out. You may be being scammed. In reading the four Gospels, a different order, Calvin said, would be better, which is that when we wish to read in Matthew and others that Christ was given to us by the Father, we should first learn from John the purpose for which he was manifested. And I'll tell you what, Calvin did not quote Luke 4.43, which tells you why Jesus came namely to preach the gospel of the kingdom. So Christians should awake to the fact that their various traditional systems claiming to be based on scripture have not served them well. Scripture nowhere says that John's gospel is to be preferred over Matthew, Mark, and Luke, nor does it teach that Jesus preached a Jewish message up to the cross, whereupon Paul, so the theory goes, and very wrong it is, Paul then took a different message of grace to the Gentiles. The fact is that the gospel, as Jesus preached it, is so essential for our salvation that it's repeated no less than three complementary versions, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, with John only confirming the very same teaching, often admittedly in different vocabulary. So the New Schofield Bible, for example, read by millions, next page, Page five, scroll down, please. Yes. The New Schofield Bible says that a strong legal and Jewish coloring is to be expected up to the cross. Uh-oh. Shows his dislike of that. The fact, of course, is that the whole New Testament faith is Jewish in character 
all based on the old Hebrew Bible, which is part of the only Bible they had. All of it is based correctly on the Old Testament scriptures. And consistently, the Bible does make strong demands for obedience. Now listen to this amazing statement. C.S. Lewis, very famous. He reflects the same tendency. He doesn't seem to think that Jesus preached the gospel. Can you believe that? I hope that these remarks are eye-opening. The following quotation points to a fundamental and amazing systematic misconception at the heart of much popular Christianity. C.S. Lewis wrote, the epistles, he said, are for the most part the earliest Christian documents we possess. The gospels came later. In terms of writing, that's true. But notice Jesus preached the gospel long before the epistles were written. Then, C.S. Lewis said, the gospels are not the gospel. Let those words sink down deep into your mind and be duly appalled. Lewis, C.S. Lewis said, the gospel of salvation is not in the gospels. That's amazing, the statement of Christian belief. And I say the opposite. I say the gospel is the saving gospel of the kingdom. So then, according to C.S. Lewis, Christ's words are not the statement of Christianity. What? That's the spirit of pure antichrist, and I warn you against it. In that sense, C.S. Lewis said, the epistles are more primitive and more central than the gospels. Though not, of course, in the great events of the gospel. He allows you, there are miracles in the gospel, all that's good, but the gospel is not in the gospels. Tell your friends about that. The gospel is not in the gospels? What? You must be joking, I think, would be the American reaction to that today. So, I'm reading down now the next paragraph. What happened then to Jesus, saving gospel of the kingdom? Because that's the question. You see that Luther and C.S. Lewis rather skillfully bypass the gospel according to Jesus, which you find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in John, of course, but firstly, repeated three times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, Billy Graham, I'm going to have a shot at him. I don't have any personal malice against Billy Graham and his descendants, of course, but notice this, a widely circulated tract entitled, What is the Gospel?, which contains no reference to the kingdom of God, never. That tract declares that Jesus, catch this, said what, what Billy Graham said, came to do three days' work, to die, to be buried and raised. But he came not primarily to preach the gospel. Billy, my good man, you got it completely wrong. Billy Graham says that Jesus came rather there might be a gospel to preach. He didn't know his Luke 4.43. It's impossible to reconcile those statements of Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, with Jesus' declaration that he was commissioned, and here we're back to Luke 4.43, which is a memory verse for all of you, for the very purpose of proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Luke 4, verse 43. It cannot be too strongly emphasized that Christianity, which is not rooted and anchored and grounded in the historical Jesus, may turn out to be just another faith, another religion. If people are asked to, quote, accept Christ, ask him into their hearts without being told about the message of the historical Christ, the gospel of the kingdom, how can we be sure that Christ is not just an abstract, vague symbol? The real question then is, in the words of John Sobrino, perhaps then this spirit, this vague spirit, is a spirit which is simply vague and it may not be the spirit of Jesus, John Sabrina suggested. It's an abstract spirit that's nothing more than a sublimated embodiment, a sort of emotional, mushy, vague thing about natural religious person's desires. If it is that latter thing, Sabrina said, then it's not only different from, but actually contrary to the spirit of Jesus, who always preached the gospel of the kingdom. So more from the Billy Graham Association. The word gospel occurs over a hundred times in the New Testament. What then is the gospel of the grace of God? Watch this carefully now. Let's ask Paul for the answer. Why are you asking Paul first? Why don't you ask Jesus? That didn't occur to the Billy Graham Association. So let's ask Paul for the answer. Paul would point us to 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul said, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you. Here it is according to 
the Billy Graham Association. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and rose. And then Billy Graham goes on to say, Paul never discussed the earthly life of our Lord. Uh-oh, that's a falsehood. The fact is that the Lord Jesus died, this is Billy Graham, died to save his one half of the gospel. Billy Graham said, the fact that he rose from the dead is the other half of the gospel. Is that true? I'm about to say absolutely false. Why is there not a single sentence in the Billy Graham literature about the gospel which Jesus preached? That's to say the gospel about the kingdom of God. Why are we not pointed to Paul's own definition of the gospel given in the very next verse after he speaks of the gospel of the grace of God? Now catch this. This is one of the major crime scenes in popular commentary. Paul spoke in Acts 20, verses 24 and 25, spoke about the gospel of the grace of God. Paul said, the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus was to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. To you among whom I went about, what? Proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. There it is. So let me please impress this on your minds forever. The gospel of the grace of God is exactly the same as the proclaiming of the gospel of the kingdom. So the gospel of the grace of God is the gospel of the kingdom. There's no difference at all. It's the same thing. God's grace is proclaimed in the proclamation about the kingdom of God. The great world government, this is the definition of the kingdom, which Jesus has promised to establish with his followers on earth when he returns. For that, you'll see those verses in Daniel, which you're going to have to use all the time in your teaching. Jesus was and is preparing for that great coming day of the kingdom in which he and the immortalized saints, as they then will be, will take charge of the renewed earth. Think about that. Now, the word word, little w-o-r-d, in the God is the gospel of the kingdom. You see, these people were so keen on the gospel of the kingdom, and sometimes they just referred to it as the word. They didn't mean the whole Bible. So we're basically muddling everything in our false use of words. The word word in the New Testament largely, very frequently, means the Christian gospel. It was proclaimed by Jesus and the apostles. It was and is the gospel about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus. There you have Mark 1 which says the beginning of the gospel. Mark chapter 1, verse 1, 14 and 15, the beginning, the beginning, the beginning of the gospel. And Luke 4, 43 and the other verses there. The death and resurrection of Jesus are, of course, essential elements included in the gospel, but they do not constitute the whole gospel. So the saving gospel, the message about the kingdom, which is your destiny, this gospel, they call this gospel about the kingdom. In other words, this well-known gospel we all know about, Matthew 24, 14, which Jesus stated is the basis of salvation. We've got the verses there. Was the center of all biblical preaching, and it had better be then the center of all the preaching and teaching that you do. Otherwise, you don't sound like Jesus, and that's dangerous. It's the message which Satan hates. That's an interesting idea. Luke 8, 12. You have Acts 8.12, which is the founding text of the Abrahamic people in the 1830s. And Luke 8.12, easy to remember, 8.12. Luke 8.12 says that when anybody hears about the kingdom of God gospel, the devil's trying to snatch it out of his heart so that he would not get saved. That's astonishing. The devil knows better than the public where to work at confusing people. It's called throughout the New Testament, the word, the word of the Lord. The term word is positively not just a way of saying the Bible, which we call the scriptures. The word with little case W is the core and heart of the Bible. That core and heart is found in the saving words of Jesus, his gospel of the kingdom. It appears then that we have abandoned Jesus' gospel of the kingdom. But to abandon Jesus' gospel is to abandon him. You cannot accept Jesus if you don't accept his words, not only his work on the cross, most important, but you must accept his words summarized as the gospel of the kingdom. We have claimed by proof texting from one passage in Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, that the gospel is a message only about the death and resurrection for our sins, death and resurrection of Jesus for our sins. But this is untrue. 
It's proved by the fact that Jesus and the disciples preached the gospel, calling it the gospel about the kingdom and calling it the gospel long before a word was said about his death for sin and resurrection, which came later. So the loss of the Jesus of history, that's what you're facing as you attempt to explain these things to your friends. The history of Christianity ought to give churchgoers cause for alarm. Because of an anti-intellectual approach to faith, many remain in ignorance. They don't know these things that we're going through this evening of the great issues affecting their relationship with God. When theologians ponder the condition of the church over the centuries, they often rightly expose an extraordinary departure from the historical Jesus. David Kaler writes this, Christian faith correctly says, has not, as it should, has not centered on the historical Jesus. Now look at this, the Apostles' Creed demonstrate the truth of his statement because the Apostles' Creed, so-called, which is not a Bible creed, it moves from born of the Virgin Mary to crucified under Pontius Pilate. Did you catch that? Born of the Virgin Mary, whoops, died. What about his preaching of the gospel of the kingdom? Just left it out. So the creed's omission suggests that the intervening years and activities of Jesus were really of no consequence. And I say they are absolutely essential to your salvation. Theologically and ethically, it's not enough to say that a death and resurrection have occurred. You must say who this Jesus was, whom the Romans executed, and God raised from the dead. And these matters are most important, not only for the historian, but for the theologian and the believer. And Finally, historical character of Jesus, not merely a spiritual so-called Christ, provides Christian faith with its reason for being and its power to bring about change in personal social life. So if the Jesus claimed as savior is not anchored in the historical figure recorded in the New Testament, who knows what kind of a Jesus may be embraced? Seems clear to me that the Satan could well play on the weakness of our religious spirit of man by presenting a Jesus who's only vaguely and superficially the Jesus of the Bible. The counterfeit, the fake version of the gospel, could, however, be most subtle. Satanic strategy would work hard to separate Jesus from his own teachings, which are laid out in their clearest form in Matthew, Mark, Luke. Jesus, in quotes, might then be only a vague religious symbol offered as a spiritual panacea for the world's and individual individuals ills the jewish apocalyptic that's one who talks about the future second coming and the establishment of the kingdom the jewish jesus and jesus was a jew the whole bible is thoroughly jewish he was a preacher of coming just society on earth the kingdom of god if what i've just been describing has happened then the true Jesus might fall into disrepute and obscurity. His reappearance in preaching would probably appear strange and too Jewish for people and even unwanted to church goers who have been fed a diet missing the New Testament Hebrew Jewish ingredients. Safest policy then against deception would be to reinstate the gospel about the kingdom at the heart of all preaching. This would ensure against the tendency to make Jesus up out of your own heart, your own mind. It would also safeguard believers against the extravagant assertion of a leading theologian who remarked, what can be said about the historical Jesus belongs to the realm of the Christ according to the flesh. In other words, he disparages the Christ according to the flesh. That Christ, however, does not concern us, this theologian said. What? You mean Jesus is of no concern to you. What went on in Jesus' heart, I don't know and I don't care. That tendency is terribly bad. It's expressed, uh, as expressed that way, that we don't care about the historical Jesus, plagues a number of theological schools of thought, not least the school which relegates the teaching of Jesus to a ministry of to Jews only and applies his ethical instructions to the future millennium. That's 
basically what they teach at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary is very wrong. Finally, the land promise. The land kingdom promise, which is the heart of Jesus' gospel, has been virtually lost. The 77% of our Bible, which is the Old Testament, very Jewish, very Hebrew, has been detached from the New Testament. We've forgotten that God preached the gospel to Abraham. That's a wonderful verse. Abraham was a Christian believer before the time, and that the New Testament gospel preaching by Jesus is based on the covenant made with Abraham. Now we're talking the Abrahamic faith as it was at its best in the 1830s. God promised a land to Abraham and his spiritual descendants in the same way Jesus promised the land to Christians. The Billy Graham system says on television day after day, are you sure you go to heaven when you die? Wait a minute, Billy, with great respect. That's a false question. Nobody goes to heaven when they die. So after nearly 2,000 years of uncomprehending Gentile opposition, the promise to Abraham of progeny, property, and prosperity must be reinstated in the church's teaching, in your teaching, as a coherent and unifying theme of biblical faith. It must go back there. There could be no greater rallying point for fragmented Christendom. No other theme than that which ties together all of divine revelation can provide the churches with the unified message of the kingdom of God gospel, which they so desperately need. Finally, with James Dunn here, has some very interesting things to say. <clears throat> I corresponded with him over the years. Uh, lately deceased, he's not living anymore. He says the idea of inheritance, James Dunn, the fundamental part of Jewish understanding, and I hope of your understanding, of the covenant relationship with God, above all, indeed, almost exclusively in connection with the land, yes, the land of Canaan, there's by right of inheritance as promised to Abraham. This is one of the most emotive and exciting themes in Jewish national self-identity, integral to the national faith, faith was the conviction that God had given Israel the inheritance of Palestine, the promised land. It is this axiom which Paul evokes and refers to the new Christian movement. So if you're a Christian, you'd better be interested in the inheritance of the land promised to Israel and promised to you as God's Israel, his special people. The promise of the land has been transformed into the promise of the kingdom. Of course, James Dunn is right, that inheritance of the kingdom, full citizenship under the rule of God alone is something still awaited by believers. Gospel is God's promise to Abraham. Again, we must insist that you go back to Abraham to define the gospel. And then Dunn has another statement. I won't read that one, that paragraph. But Paul's case reveals the strong continuity. I skipped a paragraph there. Paul's case reveals the stronger continuity he saw between his faith and the fundamental promise of his people's scriptures, the Jewish scriptures. Paul had no doubt that the gospel he proclaimed was a continuation and fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. I hope that's clear to you, but he was equally clear that the heirs of Abraham's promise were no longer to be identified in terms of the law of Moses. For Genesis 15, 6, we read Abraham believed God and he was a, a believer before the time of Christ, believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. God said, I like people who believe in my kingdom plan and I reckon them as being right rather than wrong. Being sympathetic to Jewish understanding, now the quote then from Scala, first task of exegesis explaining the Bible is to penetrate as far as possible inside the historical context of the author. In other words, you better get the historical sense of Jesus as a Jew, what Jews believed. So much of this involves the taken for granted of author and addressee. In our case, a major part of the context is the self-understanding of Jews, and Jesus was a Jew, and Judaism, the whole Bible is really a product of Judaism in the first century. Now, Dunn says this, since most of Christian history and scholarship, regrettably, has been unsympathetic to that self-understanding of Jews, if not downright hostile, then a proper appreciation of Paul 
in his interaction with that self-understanding has been virtually impossible. See, that's very serious. Canon Gouge finally warned of a disaster in preaching and practice. The replacement of Jewish ways of thinking, that's the thinking of the Bible writers, by Gentile ideas has been a disaster affecting the denominations. And here's the final quote that I have for you today. After New Testament times, the great people of God's choice, move up to the last page, right? The great people of God's choice, the Jews, were soon the least adequately represented in the Catholic Church. And then Canon Guru says, this was a disaster to the church itself. It meant that the church as a whole failed to understand the Old Testament, uh-oh, and that the Greek mind, the Roman mind in turn, came to dominate the church. That's the church in which you may well have been born if you were born into a Protestant denomination. From that disaster, the church has never recovered either in doctrine or practice. See, your job then is to engage one of thousands of sites online and ask them, what's the gospel? And when they don't mention the kingdom, you can engage them in conversation. So there are some of the final statements that will summarize what I've been trying to say here. I wish you well. If you have any questions at all, you can always write to me at anthonybuzzard at mindspring.com, and I'd be happy to engage you in any of these topics. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Uh, thanks, Anthony, for that. So the paper will be made available soon. Uh, we have some questions here, if you don't mind, but before then, let you take a breather while I'll introduce people to the homepage of focusonthekingdom.org. So as you see there, just click on the link. I'll just show you quickly, and then we'll go to some questions here, Anthony. Uh, click on articles if you'd like to read up more on this topic under articles as you can see you have the journal from the radical reformation back issues you can sift through and find topics related to this and of course the first topic there the gospel of the kingdom and many articles where anthony uh, touches on on these matters the so-called amil view and most of all, just explaining are the, I guess, the mainstream interpretation of the kingdom, I guess, Jesus' gospel of the kingdom, does the common scholar consensus, if I may dare say, although scholars are notorious, like rabbis, you might get two scholars in a room with four different views, but I think overall, there is a consensus about Jesus kingdom gospel or the Jewish gospel, the kingdom of David being restored and all that good stuff. Prophet Daniel, you might get some so-called historicists in there and preterists, but I think overall it's, it's pretty clear. So, all right, let's see. So, we have a few questions mm. here, Anthony, if you mm. don't mind. No, it's fine. You got, you got your breath back. <laughs> That's a lot of reading there. All right, let's go to a few here. Can you explain Colossians 1.13, transferred yes. us to the kingdom of his beloved son? Yes. Uh, there is a sense in which the presence of the kingdom is right. Let me say that the word kingdom of God in the New Testament mostly not invariably, but mostly, in the majority of cases, refers to that future kingdom which begins at the second coming. Joseph of Arimathea was waiting for the kingdom and so on. But sometimes the word kingdom of God just means Christianity. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, Paul said, but righteousness. That means the Christian faith. So we've been transferred from the kingdom of Satan into the present spiritual kingdom of God, but that's not to be confused with the future kingdom, which will be a real territory on the earth. So that's a great question. You can look at that and just tell yourself the kingdom of God is present in a different sense 
and that's a very Hebrew way of grasping a totality, no problem for them. We have been put, we have been transferred out of Satan's kingdom, but we're not ruling with Christ as I've opened tonight. You are not ruling with Christ. When the kingdom comes, the throne of David will be established. You can go to Israel today. You won't find the throne of David there. The kingdom of God has not come in that major, properly speaking, sense. But this is an exception. This is a transference into the kingdom of God now, into the Christian faith. Uh, so just to be clear, you, you think Paul is saying you've been uh, transferred into the into the faith, into the Christian faith. Absolutely. That's what I think so. He's rescued us, past tense, from the domain of darkness. That's Satan's kingdom. We've been transferred. So this would be, uh, so this would be quite a, uh, a unique interpretation by the former Pharisee Paul about the word kingdom from his Jewish ancestry, um, I guess. Yes, it might be. I, quite I a departure. Know. But I, I'm not going to deny that's a past tense. He rescued in the past. All it's right. Uh, let's yep. go to more questions here. Uh, would Jesus think it acceptable to live out his millennial reign or the deception that it's going on now? If not, can we blow it off or should we expose it so others are not deceived? <laughs> well, that's an interesting point you make. I think the, your point is certainly correct at the bottom. We cannot blow it off. This is an element of the gospel of the kingdom. The thousand year reign is the goal of the kingdom of God gospel when you and Jesus are going to rule and reign on the earth. No, I say that's absolutely essential understanding. You don't want to put the future into the past and that millennial reign is your destiny. You as a Christian are being trained now through your much tribulation and difficulties that we all go through in order to rule the world with Messiah when he comes back. You're not doing that now. Paul was very skeptical about a present reign. You're not reigning. Would to God we were reigning, Paul said. I began with that. I wish to God we were reigning so we could all be ruling and reigning in the world during the millennium, which is the first stage of that future kingdom. Yeah. Thank you. We'll go to another question here and i'll bring up the verse so yes. what about the fact that a thousand years can be symbolic not literal and we have a couple of verses there ecclesiastes 6 6 even if the man lives a thousand years twice but does not see good things do not all go to one and the same place and psalm 90 verse 4 for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by or like a watch in the night yes that's a good so, point uh, i don't care if it's 999 years but why i'm taking it literally is because it speaks of people who had been beheaded tell me what that would mean not literally those who became beheaded or had been beheaded, they were martyrs, came to life and began to reign for a thousand years. It's a very long time. Now, the Seventh-day Adventists say that there will be nobody on the earth in the millennium. So tell your SDA friends, that's just wrong. Ellen G. White, their guru, left out the words in Isaiah 24, where it says few people will be left. She just left that out. She said Satan alone will be on the earth in the future and no human beings Will be there at all that's an error so i don't care if it's 950 years it's a long time they're not going to rule for one day that's just out of the question but above all to be beheaded cannot be taken non-literally but you raise a good point um yep. let's see a related question i guess uh, is coming to life simply a hebrew idiom for christian conversion ephesians 2 even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Yep. So is that That's right. not a coming to That life? wasn't beheaded people. The point is that in Revelation 20, the people were beheaded before they came to life. 
That's a literal death by beheading. Nothing about that in Ephesians, but you're right to point out to a non-literal revival in terms of our, of our uh, salvation. That's absolutely true. You can have that, but not where it speaks of those who had been beheaded began to live. Beheading is a non-negotiable term. It means you had your head cut off. That's not true of being converted. Okay, uh, let's see. Joe Martin, how about the millennium as a time to teach those born about the true Messiah? We could have 40 yes. generations of birthed people, yes. though we will be mortal. Why not? That's great. There will be few people surviving. That's Isaiah chapter 24. Few human beings will survive into the kingdom as mortals. They won't be fit to be immortalized. But those people, of course, will quickly multiply as they did after the flood. And so Joe is exactly right. This is a time of mass conversion of people who perhaps didn't know much about any of this, but they will be living. And some of them will live to 100 years old and be considered young. That's an interesting text. In Isaiah 65, in the new heaven, new earth of the millennial age, if you die when you're 100, just a kid. That shows longevity will be the sign of the times. I think that's wonderful. Joe's going to love that as much as I do. By the way, Joe and Rebecca did wonderful work, work in Africa, and it's because of their ceaseless, untiring efforts of going to Africa that thousands of people there in Malawi and Tanzania and other places know about the gospel of the kingdom. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Didn't Jesus and Paul teach only one resurrection? I'll bring up the text here, John 5. <clears throat> so Jesus says, do not be amazed at this. Uh, a time is coming when all who are in the tombs or the graves will hear his voice, will come out those who did the good to a resurrection of life, those who committed bad, resurrection of judgment so that sounds like one resurrection and then the resurrection chapter first corinthians 15 uh 20 to 28 <coughs> let's see um i'll start in 22 for as in adam all die so also in christ all will be made alive each in his own order christ the first fruits after that those who are christ that is coming then the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, he has abolished all rule, authority, power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And then he talks about the supremacy of God the Father. So, yeah. what do you. Imagine? Well, I, first of all, the two re resurrections are completely clear in Revelation. I think that they're easily harmonized with the text you just read there. And this one in John is very clear. There's a resurrection to life. And there's also a resurrection to judgment, not condemnation, as mistranslated in the King James. So two resurrections will fit those other passages as well, but they're not expressly spelled out as they are in Revelation 20. But in that passage, they are unmistakable. So you can have a resurrection of life. That's the first resurrection. And a resurrection to judgment, which would be to be assessed for what you've done according to what you reasonably could know. So there's no problem at all with that or in 1 Corinthians 15. And in Daniel 12, you have those people who are sleeping in the dust of the ground will awake some to the resurrection of life. And the rabbis saw two resurrections there. Some who are not resurrected will be resurrected later. So none of that is really a problem, but it's utterly clear in Revelation 20. All right, thank you. A couple more, Anthony, if you yeah, don't that's mind. Fine. Um, yeah. uh, thank you for your faithful kingdom service, Anthony. Yeah. What would you say to the comment, the millennium is only mentioned in Revelation and only by name once or twice? Well, I, I would say, how much do you need? The kingdom of God as the event of the second coming is mentioned all over. It's part of the gospel. Revelation 20 simply unpacks more detail, but how much evidence do you need before you believe it? Who said you cannot, cannot believe Revelation 20? Until somebody comes along and tries to tell you the millennium is now, 
which gets rid of the whole thing. And that's my paper was against that. So that thousand year reign is a detail which is added and comes only once expressly. But the kingdom of God in the future is the idea. And there happens to be a first stage of that, which is going to be marvelous. So there'll be human beings in there who will die and thought to be young, dying at 100. I mean, that's an enviable thing. It's going to be a world in which the warfare of the present societies is going to come to an end. You will not be able to build a tank or have a gun to threaten somebody else. And you, as a Christian in training, are destined to rule the world with Jesus. That part of the gospel doesn't get much publicity. It should. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Will the people who are raised in the second resurrection yes. and who are written in the book of life be those who died during the millennium and also those Christians who did not overcome yet have faith? Well, the first, uh, it's a good question. The second resurrection is all the rest of the dead. Every human being not in the first resurrection will be resurrected in the second resurrection. So it would be a lot of people over the years since the creation of Adam and Eve who have never came to faith and they will be assessed according to what they reasonably could know. God is a God of justice and fairness. He's not going to condemn to destruction babies who had little more than a few weeks of life, let's say, or other people who never heard of any of these truths they will have their chance to learn in the second resurrection. We call that the wider hope. It's a blessed doctrine because it means that a lot of people who never heard of Jesus, they may have done some good things, and that's to their credit, but they never became Christians in the full sense. They will have that opportunity in the second resurrection, the wider hope. At our site, you'll find nice articles on what's called the wider hope. Okay. All right. Thanks, Anthony. Mm -hmm. Thanks uh, Thank for you. that. I'll let you go. Now to, <laughs> thanks for all, all that reading. So that's it. Uh, that is day two of the theological conference. And we thank Anthony for his continued service and work. And um, yep, look out for that paper and the under presenters and at the bottom as as I said earlier. Okay, so there's the schedule. We will uh, wrap it up for today. It's been a long day for some of us. So we thank you once again for those who watched live throughout the day. I know it's obviously difficult to do that. People do have lives, we understand. But we're blessed and uh, honored really to bring this to you all day so thanks to the presenters today of course tracy joe dr nemesh and those uh, wonderful faith stories tomorrow we start with the last faith story remember the times eastern standard time 10 a.m and um let's see and then we have pastor dennis baldwin it's sort of a tradition uh, pastor wraps it up for this 32nd theological conference so until then until we meet again god bless and we'll see you in the morning